Welcome to WTF Crypto, where we peel back the layers of the onion of the crypto universe to understand what's really going on and how it affects you and your portfolio. I'm your host, Mark Lurie of Shipyard Software, and as a caveat, nothing in this podcast is legal or investing advice. Today, we're talking about fractionalizing NFTs with Andy of Tessera, formerly known as Fractional. Welcome, Andy. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Now, you told me over 140 artists have sold $100,000 of more or more of NFTs. I mean, that's an amazing number. You're actually off by an order of magnitude. It's 100. Oh, I am. It's 1,040. Wow. 1,040 artists have sold over $100,000 worth of NFTs. Okay. That is a lot. Uh, I mean... It is the new medium of our time in the same way that photography was the new medium of the early 20th century. So it's very exciting. And it's also important because traders don't just want to trade projects and tokens. They also want to trade NFTs um, and collect NFTs. But in the traditional art market, the most reliable returns come from blue chip artists. But those are so expensive that, that only the wealthiest collectors tend to be able to buy in. And in crypto, it seems like maybe the same dynamic is emerging. For example, the floor on CryptoPunks is like really, it's, it's large. I mean, I, it's got to be six figures. Does that sound right? Yeah. At, at last I checked a couple of days ago, I think it was about 140,000 or so. Okay. So that's, that's a high buy-in. And one potential solution is fractionalizing NFTs so that everyday traders can get exposure to an asset that would otherwise have a prohibitive buy-in. And so I think it's really important to understand how that works for everyday traders, um, you know, and, and users throughout the crypto ecosystem. That's what we're going to start digging into today. I'd love to start just by understanding what makes you such a credible expert and guide on this subject. Yeah, well, I guess uh, I appreciate you saying I'm an expert and guide. I'll take it. <laughs> um, but I, I've been in the crypto space for a long time. I. I've been writing smart contracts for the last five years or so. Spent a long time at MakerDAO, building DAI and uh, kind of everything that goes along with that. It was a fun time, very, very different from the NFT space in a lot of ways. And once I left Maker kind of during the DeFi summer craziness, I got really, really obsessed with NFTs. Um, I've always kind of enjoyed sneakers and other collectibles and stuff. And so it was cool to kind of see that get mapped to career interests outside of um, like my personal interests. And so from there, it was experimenting with a bunch of different things and kind of what more like interesting mechanism stuff you can do with NFTs uh, and kind of found myself really fa falling really interested and curious about like collective ownership and fractionalization and kind of some of the fun challenges that come along with that and been spending the last just under two years um, really just spending most of my time thinking about how to do this in a way that's efficient and really maximizing or, or using all the power of smart contracts and stuff like that. Makes sense. So you're a sneaker collector. That's a big category. Yeah, yeah. It was, uh, you know, before I was writing smart contracts, I was writing bots to get Supreme drops and Nike drops and all that stuff <laughs> uh, back in a past life. Nice, nice. Great. And, and so the, the project you're working on now fractionalizes uh, NFTs. So can you tell us a little bit about that and, and how it actually works? At a high level, the way that it works is you take an NFT and basically make a, a smart contract call to a factory and say, hey, I have this NFT and I want to put it into a vault. And then that vault is going to give back a bunch of tokens. And those are also NFTs. Um, and so those will have you know, metadata showing what NFT they represent, kind of what they are, different things like that. Um, and then all of those obviously can freely move around, trade, whatever. And then from there, kind of the other major part of that is how do you eventually reclaim the NFT that is inside of this vault and how do you get it back out? And generally that's going to be done through selling the NFT that's inside of the vault. Uh, and that can either be through a bid where someone comes to the platform and says, hey, I want to buy this for 100 Ethereum or through all of the, uh, the token holders saying, hey, we want to sell this NFT on an exchange for 100 Ethereum and then listing it there, kind of seeing if someone will come and buy it. Okay, got it. So, so 
let me repeat that back to you just so I make sure I understand it. So you take an NFT, let's say it's a, you know, punk, and you put it in a vault, and then you issue shares of it, which are NFTs themselves, not ERC-20s. Yes, they're right? ERC-1155s. Okay. And what is an ERC-1155? So there's an NFT, NFT is an ERC-721, right? And... And ERC-20 is like a token, like, you know, link or, or wrap Bitcoin or just, you know, this general token standard. So what, what, is, what is yours? So 1155s have existed for a while. They were made originally by Engine uh, a long time ago, basically for like in-game assets was kind of their first thing they made them for. Um, but essentially they are NFTs that can also have more than one supply of the individual token. So it's almost like a contract that is both 721 and ERC-20 in a lot of ways. So you could have token ID 0 that has 100 tokens, 100 token supply, token ID 1 has a 500 token supply, and each one of those would have the exact same metadata and all of that. So it really allows for like a registry of semi-fungible NFTs. I see, interesting. And just out of curiosity, why use that instead of ERC twenty uh, ERC twenty tokens, which would just kind of be you know a thousand shares of one NFT? Yeah, because really something that we care about a lot and that we think is really important is being able to meet like art collectors and the people who really care about the things that they're buying where they are, and they want to they want to see the NFTs that they're buying. They they don't want to see a, a token balance in a wallet. Um, it, and I think it's a really important part of like the emotional collecting experience to, if you buy one, one percent of a crypto punk, you want to see NFTs in your wallet that represent that one percent of a crypto punk as opposed to ERC 20 tokens. I think it's like a pretty meaningful kind of emotional and psychological difference and kind of just like at the cause of why people want to be doing it. Yeah. I mean, that makes a lot of sense because ultimately like the value of NFTs in the first place is a, is a psychological thing, right? Like collecting is, so deep in our psychology, it's, it's, you know, pre-consciousness, right? Like crows and ravens collect shiny objects and, you know, and, and we did since the beginning of prehistory. So, so it makes, it makes sense actually that there would, it's important to have that framed the right way. Yeah. And we actually, we, when we originally launched our first version as, as fractional, they were ERC 20 tokens and it was, it was pretty consistent feedback that we got from people uh, and users on the platform that they wish that they were NFTs because that's how they, that's how they interact with the medium in general. And so, you know, if they, they if they want to show it off in a gallery or hang it on their wall, it just feels kind of weird that that's not really an option. Makes sense. And so in their NFT wallet, they actually see the kind of image of the whole thing. Yeah. And it'll, you know, it'll have a little, it, they almost think of them like additions to a certain yep. extent where you say, you know, this is, one out of a thousand or something. Mm -hmm. And so there'll be, you know, small, small watermarks kind of to make it clear that this is not the original NFT, um, but at the same time, allow people to have a nice consumptive experience of the stuff that they own. Okay. Got it. Okay. So let's sit back as a moment and just kind of understand what's, what's, why this exists and, and what's going on today. And then we can pull out. So why do NFTs in your opinion need to be fractionalized at all? Yeah. So I think, and like you're saying, I think collecting and a lot of the stuff kind of goes back to much more like primitive parts of society. But in general, there's always going to be really rare things, I think, that are people deem valuable. Um, and previously, prior to NFTs, it is a significantly more complex system to make it so that a bunch of people can all own something together. When you think about like a house or a piece of artwork, like a traditional piece of artwork. You need a lot more kind of rules and regulations around that to ensure that everyone actually does, say, own 10% of a, a painting. But there's a lot of demand for for those types of things. There's, yeah, you know, there's like some some stuff that you see, like Masterworks is a huge example of that in the art world, where they have tons of tons of paintings that all exist that people are able to to buy into. Um, I, I think in general, what Yep. And, and Masterworks, actually, just to flag that, so Masterworks is a offline company. They actually will buy blue chip art pieces, let's say worth in the millions. They'll put it in an art storage center. They'll then allow people 
credit investors, I believe, to basically buy a percentage of that. They're basically buying into a, an art fund, maybe even a single object art fund. And, and that's essentially, that, you know, not blockchain or crypto related at all, but that's how that works in the traditional yeah. art business. And I think they, they had a billion plus valuation or something like that. So presumably- I think so. Yeah, I think sometime you know, last year. You know, you never know what that really means, but presumably some people are doing it. Yeah, definitely. And I, and I think what's really fun and exciting about it in the NFT space is you can do it at so, like- such a deeper level where because it's all smart contracts and all programmable, it's not a handshake agreement. It's not that you have to go to some third party and create some legal framework for how this works. You can literally just put the NFT inside of a smart contract and say, these are now the tokens that have governance over this smart contract. And so it's a, it actually like is a way better system for exactly those same types of like desires. Um, and, and it, I think it creates some really interesting kind of incentives around creating community and, and, finding like-minded people who all want to own the same things as you. And, uh, and like you were saying earlier, the, the price of some of these really blue chip NFTs have gotten to a point where uh, if someone comes in, comes into crypto and they want to buy something and start collecting, it's, it's very, very hard to even know where to go um, because either you have to just collect random things that you, you don't know who the creators are. There's no real um, market for them, or you have to have a lot of money to be able to come in and, and kind of, uh, start collecting blue chip stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, makes sense. And and how? Why are people coming in to do this today? Do you think it's because they are speculating on the future growth? Do you think it's because they, you know, really just want to collect the piece? What What are the various reasons that people come in, and how does that play into the types of pieces? tend to be fractionalized like is it blue chip art or is it often not blue chip art yeah you know it really the stuff that gets fractionalized is really varied and we've kind of seen a few different buckets of things that have really people have shown interest in i would say one has been almost using the art as uh Kind of bootstrapping a larger community or DAO or something like that. We've seen that a few instances. A few instances of that. One was the Doge NFT that was put onto um, onto Fractional back. This was a long time ago at this point, and it's like kind of bootstrapped an entire new DAO called the based on a token called Dog, and they have people who work for the DAO now, and it's really turned into kind of a, a whole beast of its own, uh, really outside of our our ecosystem, uh, which is really cool in a very cool application. And we've seen that a couple other times. Uh, There's one called Free Ross DAO, where they bought Ross Ulbricht's Genesis NFT. Um, and But in that fundraise to buy it, they've also, they raised more, more than enough money. And now the token is essentially a governance token over that treasury of funds. And they're trying to do what they can to free Ross Ulbricht. And so that's been a really interesting kind of use case that we didn't totally expect, to be honest. Um, but we did we have seen a lot of kind of pooling together funds to buy NFTs that's really become a, a really big kind of use case that we've seen. Uh, one of the coolest ones, and we've seen this a few times as well, has been for charitable donations. Someone, uh, Nadia from the the artist Pussy Riot and alongside some other people for the Ukraine, sold a Ukrainian flag on, I think it was on Zora. And there was, I, th I think in total, maybe almost $8 million were raised to donate to Ukraine. Um, and now that, that Ukrainian flag NFT is on, is on our protocol, which is just a very cool use case to see um, that, you know, kind of doesn't really fit into any particular like other bucket of things, but it's very cool. And then alongside that, we've seen a lot of people who are just really excited to buy stuff that they previously couldn't. I remember when we first launched, uh, you know, we had some pretty cool Fidenzas and a full collection of art blocks and stuff. And we got a lot of messages from people saying, I, I could never afford to buy a Fidenza, but I, I love them. And I think they're really cool. And I'm excited about what what the future has for art blocks. And so now, now I have the opportunity to, and that was uh, what was really exciting for a lot of people. Interesting. Huh? Okay. So it seems like there's three things. One is people who are pooling money to buy an expensive NFT, presumably for appreciation. A second is collectors who are, are buying, you know, what's essentially like a, um, you know, a, a, an addition of a larger piece so they can credibly feel like they own it and, and they do, um, but it's not technically the original, but it, but it gets them a lot of the emotional way there. 
Um, and then three for these almost non-art purposes. It's it's access or membership or support of some you know community or charitable donation. Um, that that makes a lot of sense. Um, and, and kind of goes to the power of NFTs as an artistic medium because it opens up a lot of dimensions you can do with it beyond just it being the art itself. Uh, do you do you have a, a opinion yourself on like the best types of NF the, the types of NFTs that are best a best fit to be fractionalized? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, and again, it's probably not just like there's one one size fits all. But I, I think the, the biggest thing is that different types of NFTs probably need different types of collective ownership experiences. You know, the, the way that people want to own a crypto punk together is probably significantly different than the way that they want to own an in-game asset NFT together or noun, a nouns NFT because of the governance applications or, um, or even like a charitable donation thing or the Doge NFT where they really have these kind of unique instances. And so I think especially with scaling like Ethereum's current prices and all of that, it doesn't make a ton of sense to throw stuff onto the protocol that's, you know, super cheap um, or not even super cheap, just like even, even middling tier things. We don't generally see a ton of demand and excitement around something that's worth a thousand bucks or sometimes even like 10,000 bucks because generally people who are in the space and collecting NFTs probably have that kind of disposable income anyways currently. Uh, and so there's just not going to be that level of, demand right now to uh to do that but I, I would imagine that would change over time slowly we're just we're not really there yet um, and so generally what we've seen is the really high-end blue chip stuff has had a lot of people who are just collectors and super excited to get in and participate in a market and buy nfts that they previously couldn't um, and then the other thing i think is really the stuff that has a little bit more vision to it where it's like the doge or or free ross dow where they're they they are fractionalizing an NFT and doing that, but there is something else going on where they're they're it's a group of people all online creating some new community and um, finding like minded people who can all kind of gather behind some some cause that's more than just whatever the NFT is that's inside of a vault. Mm -hmm. Okay, makes sense. Um, and and once you have these NFTs, I mean, they are more easily tradable, right? Because the additions are not really unique. So how do you find spreads and market depth compare for these fractional NFTs versus for the NFTs themselves. And, and how do you create a market? Do you have like a automated market maker on your site or, you know, on the blockchain that you've developed and, and deployed, which makes a market for these? No, no, actually not really. The So in our version one fractional, it was since they were mostly ERC-20 tokens, uh, we integrated uh, zero X API onto the platform and would just find markets that existed. Generally, they were not the most liquid tokens because, you know, I think there's a general misconception that just uh, fractionalizing an NFT into a bunch of smaller pieces means it's going to be more liquid. Um, but I'd say that is generally not going to be the case in a lot of ways. And a lot of that goes to just one, they're not that like the total value of all of these tokens is really not that high. So it's not like you can go into Uniswap and buy half the NFT with very little slippage, like the slippage would be crazy. Mm. Um, and so for the most part, what we've seen is smaller pools and actually a lot of peer to peer trading even. Um, and they, they generally are not moving that much. And th there's definitely exceptions to that. Uh, some of the really, really large stuff has obviously has more volume and uh, you see more volume of, purchasers uh, around the time of uh, like the vault selling the NFT. You know, if someone comes in and places a bid, it becomes a much more clear that there, that there's something going on and you can see more people coming and participating at any given time. But then for our, for our newer versions where all the, all the fractions are NFTs themselves there, what we're really seeing is more so um, peer to peer stuff uh, that that's what NFT owners know. And that's what they like. And so they want to trade on an experience that feels like OpenSea, that feels like looks rare or, or a uh, gem or genie. Um, they aren't really as interested in AMM type models or things like that. Makes sense. Okay. Got it. Huh. And just out of curiosity. So, so a vault can actually trigger selling the underlying NFT. Is that then like a majority vote of the holders? Yeah. So there are, 
two kind of different ways that the sale happens. One is with listing the NFT on is on an exchange. And so a good example of that is with the punk. Um, punks basically only trade on the punks marketplace. That's like 99% of all punks liquidity is on that marketplace. And so what makes the most sense to us is that if you if a bunch of people all collectively own a punk together, they should be able to list it for sale on that marketplace. Uh, and obviously that comes with a lot of kind of governance risk because it's a cheaper thing and much more reasonable to 51% attack, something like that. And so we use a bit of a different system that we call optimistic listing, where basically I could come and say I own 10 out of 100 punk tokens. Uh, I could come to the vault and say, I want to list our punk for sale for 100 Ethereum. And I'm going to put up my 10 tokens at a 100 Ethereum valuation. And then everyone will have a rejection period where users can come and say, this is too cheap. I don't think this is fair. And they can buy that user's tokens. And so uh, if they don't buy all their tokens during that rejection period, then the punk gets listed on the underlying exchange. Uh, in this case, the punk's marketplace. And if and then at any given point, if the either the original proposer withdraws their tokens or a user comes and buys all of them, then the punk is delisted. And so it's kind of this uh, autonomous way to, for users to agree or disagree to list the underlying it's, it's NFT. Like a, and it's then like the alternative a, is like a bid. It's like a writer first refusal with the drag along, essentially. <laughs> yeah, so. you, you could say that. Okay, interesting. That's that's clever. And you know how other things like that have been dealt with in the past in the offline world. So like, it makes sense that you would have those kind of parallels and they, if they worked there, they would work here. Yeah. And it's an interesting challenge because I think a lot of the collectors on our platform, they really, they have a desire to see vaults act a lot like DAOs, at least the really outspoken people do. They want to be able to vote on how to sell it, where to sell it and trying to make it clear to people like, listen, these are not incredibly expensive DAOs to 51% attack, like there have to be more specific and explicit mechanisms of how do you actually take actions? Mm -hmm. Otherwise it just won't be safe. Mm -hmm. And so that's been kind of a fun design space to, to build in. Oh, super interesting. Okay, great. So th there's a couple more questions I have just to like make sure I understand the lay of the land today. The first is regulatory. So, you know, Arguably, an NFT is not a security, it's a collectible, right? Arguably, if you fractionalize it, it could be argued that it is, that that fraction is a security. And then that could implicate securities regulations. So how do you think about that? And, and what are the arguments in the community for and against that type of treatment? Yeah, obviously it's, and, you know, it's very much so, a lot of unknowns as is 99% of crypto <laughs> up until this point. Um, but up until now, though, what we've done to really try to position ourselves as best as possible is one, we've spent a lot of money on, on lawyers and legal fees who know a lot about, a <laughs> lot more about both. this than I do. <laughs> yeah. But then alongside that, I think the biggest thing is really trying to one, make everything fully decentralized, non-custodial, um, there's no re like real reliance on any third party or any group of people, like any individual person to have any of this work, which I think is, you know, it's crucial to anything in crypto, but same with this, we take it very seriously. And then the other thing is really just trying to make sure that, try to think about the right way to, to phrase it, but essentially that what we're making is really no different than any other DAO that exists. They're just really small. And it's a DAO that owns one thing as opposed to a DAO that has a treasury of tokens or owns a protocol. And really, based on a lot of the feedback we've gotten and the way that we've structured things, we, we feel really confident that that is the case, assuming you do things correctly. And there's a lot of you know other ways that you could do it that would, I think, be a lot more in the regulatory gray area. But to us, each of these is a little a small DAO that has a set of rules of what it can and can't do. And if... The DAOs that if a DAO that owns an NFT is a security, then most DAOs that owns that own anything are a security. Um, and so, just trying to position ourselves as best as possible to, with what little guidance we've gotten so far, makes sense. Okay, got it. I mean, I I, I think this all makes sense, right? Masterworks 
right, uh, is a security because they have and they have accredited investors because of that, right? And the definition of a security is the Howey test, which is you know I'm going to butcher this a little bit, but you know are you buying something with the expectation of profits based on the work of someone else, right? And so if you are buying a fractional piece of a NFT, well, in the case of Masterworks, it's probably a security because uh, you know you are someone else is doing the work of storing it and also deciding whether to sell it and when. Whereas in your case, people buying these are not buying them with the expectation that any specific person is going to be storing them or managing that you know fund or uh, deciding whether to sell. It's all done decentralized by smart contracts, and so so it fails the Howey test and. To me, that actually makes really intuitive sense. I mean, I'm no lawyer, but intuitively, that feels right. Yeah, um, and I think a lot of it is just I, I, most people when they learn about what we're doing, uh, they ask who custodies the NFTs, and we say no one does, and they're shocked. And so I think a lot of it is just education and explaining to people how does this actually work, what are the mechanisms that we're building, because I, I think most people think that what Tessera does is you send us NFTs, we send you tokens, and then when you want to sell, you send us an email and ask us to sell it. I don't know. Uh, it's funny. Makes sense. Out of curiosity, so Tessera is your new brand, formerly Fractional. Yeah. Why that name? Yeah, I mean, it took us a long time to get here, um, but we're really excited about it. I think for the most part, there were a couple things. One, the the name Fractional being so on the nose with kind of everything that's happening it was really nice at the start because everyone, when you, we said our name, you generally knew what we were doing. Um, but it also led to a lot of confusion for people. I mean, people would call us fractal, fractionalized, fractional art, fractional dot art. But our name was just fractional. And as much as we tried, we couldn't get people to say the right name. Uh, and that was just like very frustrating after a while. Uh, and then alongside that, you know, we really, really want people to be buying and collecting things that they love on our platform. And in conversations with a lot of the more serious like artists and creators who we want to work with and do stuff, I think there was a certain level of talking about things as being fractional where it just sounded more like a DeFi project or something that was interested in kind of something different than what artists wanted from feedback that we had gotten. Um, and yeah, and that really like, while obviously there, you know, there are masterworks and these things that are doing things that are incredibly financial in a sector that is tangential to what we're doing. Uh, it's really not what our primary goal is. And so that was just like a bit limiting there as well. And Tessera really, it's a very random word that most people probably have never heard of, um, but the definition of it really fits kind of exactly what we're trying to do. And so one of those things is that Tessera is a tile in a mosaic artwork. And um, the other meaning that is, uh, I believe is Italian, is uh it means like a identity pass or like a ticket to an event or some way that you like identify yourself and so to us you know what we're creating what we're, and what we're trying to build is a protocol and a platform and an ecosystem where you can buy pieces of artwork that you love that you identify with uh that can you know get you into a new community of people who you connect with or you know find some like-minded people of interest or maybe have an nft that gets you into a party or something who knows Makes sense. Oh, that's a that's a great name change. You know, it's hard when you're starting a company. You always have this struggle between a name that describes what you do, so people know what you do, and a name that is flexible and can uh, be used for anything you could potentially become. Right. And yeah. the thing yeah. early on, it's almost always better to just have something that describes what you do because no one even knows what what you are. Later on, it becomes constraining, and you need and, you know, always what you started out with becomes something bigger and different. And and so it it kind of makes sense that you need to change to a more generalized name. It's a, it sounds like a great pick. I, I like the name. Yeah, thank you. I think we had, we had experimented with a lot of stuff. A very early on name that we were thinking about actually was Mosaic, which is actually how I found the word. Mm. I was just like on like a related word search thing and found it. Like, yeah. Oh, this is a title. I spent a lot of time on thesaurus.com. Yeah, my, mine yeah. was, uh, it's relatedwords.org. 
Uh, it's an amazing site. It's okay, like, it it's really, that. really bare bones, but it's really fun. You, it's honestly, it's kind of fun to do regardless. You just like type in a random word and it just spits out like a hundred related words to it. Dot IO. I think it's dot org. Let me see. Org. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, this is like the words ninja words of thesaurus. <laughs> yeah. It's a fun one, but I spent so many hours on there. Oh, wow. That's great. Oh yeah. I like it. Okay. Great tip. Awesome. Okay. So, you know, the, the other thing I've always struggled with, and, you know, for those listening, I spent about 10 years in the art market, uh, doing an online marketplace for high-end collectibles, not blockchain related, and then an uh, early NFT protocol. And two things that keep coming up, I've found in business ideas and, you know, innovations in the art market. There's one misconception, which is that like the art market is this huge market because headline numbers are very big, right? Like, you know, tens, hundred billion dollars. But the reality is that like the super majority of that is for very, very expensive blue chip items. And the art market for smaller stuff is actually pretty small. And so that misconception, I think, throws a lot of people off. The second And I think more relevant here is that there is a constant desire to bring more transparency to the art market, to make it more accessible to more people. And fractionalization is something that seems to come up a lot because that's one way of, you know, making it accessible to other people and bringing more transparency. And one thing that I noticed in the traditional art market is that opacity, which is the opposite of transparency, right? is not necessarily a bug of art and collectibles. It actually is sometimes a feature, right? Like a piece that is transparent and its sale history and transparent, et cetera, like might actually trade for less than a piece that doesn't have trade history and isn't transparent and isn't accessible. And so I wonder how you think of that in the context of fractionalizing NFTs. Like, is this actually helpful for the value or does it actually hurt the value because now more people can essentially access it. Yeah. You know, I get this question a lot about like, basically does it kind of, you know, is there some specialness for like punks or something? If you know, the floor is really high and it's hard, it's hard to hard to own at all. Um, And generally my response is, I think in cases like this, the, the, ability for a bunch of people to all own something together is value additive in my opinion. And I like when I think about what is valuable for crypto punks in the long term, it's probably that the most people in the world possible are excited and happy about crypto punks. To me, one of the best ways to do that is to allow as many people as possible to be a part of it. Um, and so while I, while I can like see where that kind of line of thinking would go, I, I think that a big part of web three and a lot of NFT stuff in general is trying to, you know, relatively figure out how do you, how do you think about things that are free to consume, but valuable to own. And I think that kind of, that this, you know, collective ownership or or fractionalization doesn't really change kind of that like mental model of thinking in a lot of ways. It's just another, another piece of the puzzle. Um, But, you know, the same thing can be said of like, anyone can right click save an NFT. So why is the original one valuable? And I think that, uh, this kind of fits fits into the same discussion. Makes sense. Interesting. Do you do you have any views on why this practice is not more widespread in the traditional art market? I mean, masterworks aside, I think that it's just really hard to do. I, I to me, this is really something that ma- it just makes so much more sense as a as a crypto native feature because uh, you can actually own the stuff and you can actually uh, you know, programmatically do this. You don't have to spin up a an LLC and do all of that just to allow people to all own this thing, own something together. And so I, I think that that's a big part of it. And, we, you know, we've seen some other traditional companies also pop up who are doing this. Like Rally Road is a good example. They do a lot of like sports memorabilia and collectibles and like race cars and stuff. And, you know, pe- people do like it and do it, but I've talked with people on their team and, it, you know, it, it is a process to, from the point of saying, okay, here's the Mickey Mantle baseball card we want to put on our site to actually putting that card on their site. There's a lot of 
steps they have to do. Um, whereas when it's all NFTs in a smart contract, you send one transaction and it's all done. Cool. Yeah. I mean, makes sense. That's a, that's a perfect example of a use case for blockchain and smart contracts and for DAOs, incidentally. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's interesting, you know, you get a lot of people who, who their approach to use cases in crypto is, well, why can't you do this the normal way? Right. And then if it's, and if, if it's possible to do it the normal way, they'll often just dismiss the use case, which is a really strange thing, right? Because there's multiple ways to solve almost every problem in the world, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And, and so it's, it's kind of this like no because instead of yes if mindset, right? And, and like here you can actually say like you could do it the normal way, but it is so much more complex and complicated and expensive and time consuming that like for practical purposes, like it's just, it is 10x easier to do this way on the blockchain. And, and that's like a perfectly fine reason for a use case. You know, it's, it's a, it's, yeah. a, great, it's a great example. <laughs> yeah no totally uh, it's um and it, it's interesting too you know it becomes a lot more challenging if the nfts represent like real world assets and all of that then you get into a whole other can of worms that we have up until now wanted to stay far away from um, yeah well i'm going to open that can of worms i'm sure it'll come eventually let's do it yeah all right well what one more question before we get into that is how do you think the artists react to this do they think it's good or bad for provenance? Are they happy or sad that there's this kind of like permissionless minting of many editions around a single unique piece they've created? It really depends in my experience. Um, we've talked to artists who love it and think it's sick and think it's an awesome way to build community and are all for it. We've talked to artists who say, you know, I'm, you know, obviously I'm not going to stop you, but it's not for me. I, you know, I just want to make artwork and anything else people do with it is kind of up to their discretion. It really, really varies. And I think it kind of always will, but for the most part, I would say people like it every once in a while. Someone will say, you know, it's not for me or I, I don't really like, do you, no do one's ever, like no one's ever like this really said, like I'm upset. <sighs> like, is there a personality trait or an approach or style of artist that you're, you, you think is more correlated with one response and reaction than the other? I think generally it would, I would say more so it's easy to say like profile picture projects and like collectibles are pretty cool with it. They're like, Oh, it's sick. More composability on top of the stuff we built. Awesome. It's generally from people who I would say are more like traditional artists. But even then, I, th I think it really depends. So I'd say like kind of, but like, you know, I've spoken to a bunch of the you know, highest selling artists and most of them are like, yeah, this is interesting or at least just like, yeah, it's cool, but I don't really care about it. Uh, I, I think a lot of it just comes down to kind of how artists think about their own work and how they want to like kind of present themselves and the way that they talk about the stuff that they do, which I totally get. I think... Uh, yeah, you know, everyone has their own way that they want to like create their own narrative around their work and and who they are and what they're making. And so, I don't. I've never had anyone message us and be like, "F you, man! I can't believe <laughs> that my NFT is on your protocol." The yeah. the most I've well, ever had is just like, "It's not my favorite. Like, I don't care about it or don't want to share it." It's interesting, and I think I think it's po it's probable that most of the creators in crypto are inherently more open minded and open about this. I mean, they're here. But mm -hmm. traditional artists, artists, and in, in particular, their gallerists are very protective over when they let NFTs sell and where they're shown because they're trying to build this provenance and record in order to build, you know, a track record for an artist's career over time. And so they're very protective about that stuff. And, and it's interesting to me that that's not really the case here. But I guess people like that probably wouldn't be doing NFTs and crypto in the first place because it's inherently uncontrollable once you put it out yeah i think i think to be an nft artist you kind of have to accept that everything you make is on this significantly more global and liquid market than the traditional art market and at any point your collector can list it for sale on a, a plethora of different exchanges and so you kind of have to 
give up that that part of control. I'm sure it's weird. I like. I think they just have to find different ways to control their narrative, whether it's when they originally released the art or different things like that, as opposed to more so like the the secondary movement and kind of how the art kind of flows from different hands and what galleries it's sold in and stuff. I think you kind of have to like accept that that maybe isn't the way that you can control the narrative of the art that you make. Or make sure you get the right collectors in place who you can have conversations with and explain what you want to do. I, th I think a great example of that is like um, uh, Justin Aversano of Twin Flames. I think he's done a really great job of finding people who he knows are going to be lifelong collectors or are really huge fans or friends and trying to make sure that he can get them pieces when when someone wants one. And he's been very, very intentional about that in a lot of ways. But even then, like sometimes you do that for someone and then it goes up 10 X and they say, you know what, I'm going to sell it. Yeah. <laughs> he, he can't stop them. So yeah. Yeah. The, the four D's are death, divorce, debt, and displacement, uh, which is the overwhelming <laughs> reason that items that are collected are eventually sold, you know, whether the collector intends to or not, because people need money yeah. sometimes, you know, so <laughs> all of them come, at least one of them comes for everyone at some point, <laughs> death, if not the others. Yeah. Okay. And, and how do you think, so now I'll open this can of words. How do you think this changes once assets come on the blockchain that are either real world assets or cash flowing assets um, and are brought on chain, right? Like art, sure, you can fractionalize. What if it's a mortgage? What if it's, you know, a boat or, or a house or, you know, a silo of corn? Do you think that your technology is going to be applicable to that? Yeah, I mean, so... It's a great question. I get it a lot. Not surprisingly, the really boring answer is I don't think anyone really knows. Uh, I think the main, to me, main open question there is really what are the regulatory frameworks around bringing these things to be on chain to where, you know, whoever owns this NFT actually owns the deed to this house or actually owns the corn silo. Like, those are those are open ended questions that I certainly do not have the answer to, and I don't think very many people do, if anyone. Um, and so, to me, that's kind of like the first step that we have to get to before we can really start thinking about the how do we how do we make those assets fractionalized or really anything, lending of them, on against them, or anything. Um, this is something we thought about a lot at MakerDAO around like real world assets, and it's been a, a really challenging thing there. Even after I've been gone for a few years, there's a lot of you know, you probably have to have like a white list of people who can buy this house because you have to have KYC to prove that you're a U.S. person. And so like, what does that mean? And there's there's a lot of challenges there that we just don't have access to yet. And so what I would say is I think like at a high level, the way that I've thought about this is the mechanisms and what we're building, I think probably stand for a real world asset that's on the blockchain or a cash flowing, whatever it is versus a picture of a monkey but probably there are small tweaks and things we have to change and there's probably other like new functionality and kind of modules and add-ons that we would want to have in order to accommodate that like i could i could very quickly see a version of this you know a version of our protocol where you throw an nft that represents the right to live inside of a house and then it turns into like a a timeshare for the house where everyone who owns a one of the governance nfts for this house nft gets access for a week of the year or whatever and like it sounds silly but it's kind of cool um but there's like a lot of other stuff that would have to go into that outside of the yeah. technological side i mean timeshares are a thing clearly yeah you know so yeah yeah got it well we're almost at time andy thank you so much for joining us is there anything else you any other thoughts you'd like to share with the audience and can you tell them can I give them a little shill for your product and also how um, how they can follow you? Yeah, no, thanks for having me. Um, I feel like we really covered a lot of what we've been doing, so I don't have too much else to to mention there. Um, but if you're excited about owning NFTs and buying NFTs with your friends and all that fun stuff, uh, definitely check out tessera.co or our Twitter, which is tessera. Or you can follow me on Twitter, Andy8052, and I'll... I'm sure I will have tweeted about it relatively recently at any given time. Great. Well, thank you again so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.